The Old Stones of Land's End, Cornwall, presented by John Michel. In this lecture, John spoke about his early research into the standing stones, dolmens and stone circles in the southwest tip of Cornwall and how many things have gone missing since, specifically looking at alignments and lays. Recorded live at Megalithomania Conference 2006. I, I'm going to take you down to the, uh, the far end of, uh, of mainland Britain, uh, West Pimwith, the southwest area of Cornwall, also is famous, even more famous megalithic landscape. Uh, Cornwall, it's, uh, as you know, it's an English county, but it's also a sort of independent country. It's a duchy, uh, which I suppose the Prince of Wales, Duke of Cornwall, is the titular head. And uh, it's always been a country... Uh, um, on its own, and uh, in that west, that very far west part of Cornwall, it's a strange thing you know that most countries. This is the heartland of Cornwall. Most countries have their heartland in the centre, but in Cornwall, the heartland is in the very far west. It's a small area. They call it West Penwith now, about eight by eight miles, and it's where traditions lasted long, long after they died out up country. The last Cornish speaker in 1777 died there, and they say the language survived a little longer among the miners and tinners who, uh, um, who mined that country for really hundreds of years. The, 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 um, uh, in the, the Bronze Age, it would have really been impossible without <coughs> the Cornish minerals. People came from the Mediterranean, traders, and they went to St. Michael's Mount, according to the old accounts, and dealt in... Um, particularly the tin, which is mined in that country. And it's really the only source of a, a tin uh, which is available in the Bronze Age. You know, for, for making bronze, you need copper and tin. The copper came from Cyprus, largely, hence the name of Cyprus. But it also there's more, there's more copper. Mines were opened until quite recently in southwest Ireland and probably in Wales. So it, 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 at that time... This far west of Cornwall was very much, not an isolated country, but very much on the trade routes. And it shares uh, a traditional culture with neighbouring countries, particularly Brittany. If you look at the legends and, and the saints of Brittany, they're all the same as in Cornwall. The names are the same. Indeed, the language was the same. And in the, the time of the Roman invasion, the Cornish were allied with the Veneti, the, <coughs> the tribe in Brittany, who had a great navy, which <coughs> Caesar destroyed in about um, in the first century. In, in, uh, in um, I can't remember the date actually, but uh, uh, during the conquest uh, of Gaul, he defeated the Veneti and cut them off from Cornwall. But the Romans never re really settled Cornwall, I don't think. So until quite late, it was an independent kingdom. The Saxons brought it under control or, or invaded it and captured the rest of uh, 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 the Cornish territories in the uh, 10th century, King Athelstan. And but until then, there'd been a Cornish high king. The name of the high king was Howell, which means the sun. Uh, and he's probably a high king in the traditional way, having a, of the Bronze Age way, of having great splendor in ritual, uh, ornaments of gold and bronze and such. Uh, um, and there's quite a number of traditions associated with the stone circles and such, which associate them with... King Howell. And I wonder if the heel stone in a stone hen just seems to mean the sun too. But that, that's as it may be. Um, I was a, attracted to this far west part of the country because after I did that book in 1969, The View Over Atlantis, there were some objections. People said there was no real proof here of alignments. I wanted to find actual proof of alignments among stones going right back to the roots in the megalithic layout of the country. So, uh, for various reasons, I was attracted to this West Cornish area. I'd been there once, once or twice before to see some of the profusion of stones which, were, which are there. So I <coughs> undertook, a, as far as possible, a complete survey <coughs> of that far western uh, uh, area of West Penwith. And 
that was before um, Vivian Russell's complete list of the stones came out a few years later. Uh, I wanted to plot them all. I got six inch maps, got them stuck together. Huge thing of rolling, stick out in the field with me. It got a bit ragged and then it fell to pieces. But to start with, I got all the stones on it and found very noticeable alignments upon it. Uh, these were subject, right about the time, by that magazine Undercurrents, which was an alternative technology magazine in the, in the 70s. And they did a, a statistical survey of the alignments. And uh, uh, the only objection, of course, was, have you got a full data list? Have you got all the stones there? Well, actually, that's difficult, because even the time I've been there, many stones have disappeared. And before that, of course, there was gate depredations. Um, we know some of the extent of what's been gone um, because of old, uh, Dr. William Borlase in the, in the uh, uh, 18th century, the 19th, in, the, in the 1700s, wrote his remarkable book, uh, The um, uh, Antiquities of West Cornwall, in which he uh, uh, illustrated and explored many of the monuments and generally attributed them to the Druids, and including rocking stones and rock piles and such. He said they were Druid idols. But his book was, was uh, unique at the time. The only other person who was really going was William Stukeley. Uh, but Borlaes did for West Cornwall a great service. He opened it up to antiquarians. And since then, there's been a tremendous literature growing up upon the antiquities of West Cornwall. Uh, when I came to uh, d d do this book on the ill stones of Land's End in, I think it's 1973 or 74, uh, it was, in those days, archaeology was very much the preserve of, um, of archaeologists. And I remember uh, A.L. Rouse, who was a Cornish, Cornish resident, or a Cornishman indeed, when he heard from somewhere that I was doing a book on the stones of Land's End, he said, who's authorised him to do this? Uh, 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 who's given permission, that sort of thing. Um, but I did actually buy a subscription, a rather good way of doing it, because it wasn't a book you could sell very easily in those days. Uh, so I did, um, well, what am I going to do? You get the thing in, in, in print, and then you write around to everyone you know, including your mother and aunts and everybody else, uh, with your prospectus, and they send in the money, and then you can pay the printer, and you give them their book. Then you've got the thing in print for a popular edition later. So I did it that way, with, with a, a list of subscribers. Uh, I had a wonderful time among, in, in West Cornwall. We used to go down there. John Neal, who was speaking earlier, used to come. And several of the old, other old friends used to come down on expeditions. And we'd uh, look at all these old stones. And then look further between them to see what, what stones were missing in the alignments. Uh, and really what's so, so important about this kind of work is that you can put together a lot of the system which has gone missing. As I said earlier, there's been tremendous depredations and many stones have gone. In Borlase's book, he describes, he shows a plan actually, of an amazing complex of stone circles on moorland, <coughs> just near St. Just, on the very, the, the very far west of the, uh, uh, in, in the Land's End district. Uh, since then, these have gone completely. There's no sign of them at all. They were taken, apparently, by the miners to build an engine house. And many of the more, all through the moors of Cornwall, many of the best stones must have gone, which were recorded earlier, uh, um, for road making and such. Even in the Middle Ages, there was treasure hunting going on. They now think many of the barrows and such were rifled by treasure hunters. And of course, from the 19th century, when archaeology and excavation really got going, people like Cold Hall went through all the barrows, took all the stuff out of them, many of them, many, all of which went to museums, and many of which had been lost since. And in some ways, they've when you do those kind of investigations, when they open a barrow and destroy the, the fabric of it, it very soon is open to the elements and it leaches away. So a lot have been lost, not only the spoil taken from them, but the monuments themselves lost through being, uh, um, their integrity is broken and, and they fall to pieces. But um, my object, as I said, was to prove in this one small area, a rather isolated area, the uh, existence of uh, megalithic alignments. Um, and after the undercurrent survey, there's another one for the Royal Society for Statisticians by Simon Broadbent, who, was, who worked with uh, Alexander Tom in establishing or claiming to establish the validity of the megalithic yard. 
uh, he gave a paper to the Society of Statisticians, and I went to hear it. Uh, and he found, indeed, there were, uh, that the alignments were above any chance model. So it seemed to be proved. But then he pulled a fast one. He said, ah, yes, but uh, because these statisticians are not nearly so detached as you think they are, they're all actually hired by somebody, and they want to prove or disprove a certain point. Uh, and uh, 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 Broadbent started with what he called the negative hypothesis. And he said, this fact of alignments are more, are more prevalent than would be expected by chance uh, doesn't actually disprove the negative hypothesis. Because if you were to remove a stone, he picked, up, he picked on one of the stones which generates seven alignments. It's a huge stone. He said, if that one wasn't there, the number of alignments would fall down to almost zero. Uh, I mean, the, the chance would fall down to a chance level. But I said, well, if you're going to take stones away, I mean, somebody else could put one up and say, you can't fiddle with the statistic. Anyway, the thing was proved, although he didn't actually uh, like to admit it because he entered these special pleadings. Afterwards, we had a laugh about it, and he said he was, uh, he was uh, 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 very wrong about it. Um, but the archaeologist's reaction at the time was very poor. At that time, Glyn Daniel was editor of Antiquity, and he was very much and very scornful of anything to do with alignment systems. You see, um, uh, a generation earlier, <coughs> uh, Sir Norman Lockyer, uh, the astronomer, uh, the astronomer Royal, I think he was, uh, and the, the, the founder of Nature magazine, had been d investigating astroarchaeology or archaeoastronomy in different parts of the ancient world. And in, the, in 1901, I think it was, he did his book Stonehenge, uh, an ancient monument astronomically, astronomically considered. And one of the places he went to was, uh, uh, was this area of Cornwall. And he, he really uh, established the fact of alignments. But after he died, the reaction occurred, and archaeologists who didn't really want to go into the science of the thing, they, they thought at the time they were dealing with barbarians. They didn't like any, uh, anything to do with... Uh, with um, uh, 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 with science and ingenuity on the part of the prehistoric people. When um, Ackerson wrote an article in Antiquity, Barbarians with Brains, about Hawkins' book about uh, Stonehenge astronomy, and he said, well, they, just, they were barbarians and savages, they were, but they still were human beings. They must have had some brains. And this attitude has been so persistent. It, it still obtains now, I think, largely because of the evolutionary thought which we're, we're, we're trapped in. We always think that, uh, uh, that we are smarter than the ancients. Although, of course, when you go into it, uh, it, 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 it seems to be rather the other way around, uh, that we generated in culture, certainly, from, uh, from the earlier times. And by culture, I mean, really, how you can live simply and well without too much elaboration. And by that token, uh, the ancients were certainly more, more cultured than us, because they lived by their culture. We don't need a culture so much, because we, everything is, is done for us. Uh, uh, um, I got, to, I got some insight into uh, the, the whole structure of, of, of life, the, of, the, of life in, in megalithic times through this survey of, of West Cornwall. Uh, um, and it's, with its stone circles, standing stones, uh, dolmens or, or quoits, they call them down there, um, barrows and rocking stones and, and, uh, and other monuments, particularly natural peaks, and natural rock outcrops and such. Um, John Barnett did some work there later on and did, <coughs> did a book. He found some other stones <coughs> and alignments. And since then, there's been quite a profusion of books on the stones of lands, uh, old stones of lands. I think Paul Deborah did one, Clive Wetherill. Ian Cook did one on those fogus. The fogus being these particular uh, unique monuments to that area, which are sort of artificial underground <coughs> caves. Uh, built for a reason no one can really make out. But Ian Cook said probably that time when mining was going on, it's Iron Age, when mining was going on full blast, the rivers were very, got, became very polluted. And perhaps the, the um, people thought they needed shrines to the underground deities because miners are always very uh, conscious of spirit, superstitious or conscious of spirit. And it's quite likely that the, well, he, his idea, I think it's very likely, was that the, the uh, miners were... Uh, uh, somewhat uh, appalled by, the, by the, uh, their attack upon the earth and taking the minerals. So they had special underground shrines to placate the or to, uh, to uh, communicate with the underground spirits. But those things also come upon, uh, those underground places, fogus also come upon the alignments. Um, subsequent to, see, and, and 
uh, about 20 years ago or more, uh, West Cornwall got its own megalithic magazine. Um, Cheryl Straffan's uh, magazine, Main Mambro, Stones of Our Motherland, uh, uh, which, which comes out, it's a wonderful magazine. Uh, um, it has all the latest discoveries and ideas and good writing on the old stones of Land's End. Um, I'm going to show, all right, when I get into the details of this thing, I'll show a few pictures. I haven't got very glamorous pictures because they were all taken quite a long time ago. But as I say, since I've been there, quite a lot of stones have disappeared, particularly the smaller ones in farmers' fields. Because, and I remember what Alexander Tom said, every stone should be recorded, no matter how small it is. And the reason they're small is because you see it when you're looking at the alignments, because a small stone on the horizon really needs to be about that high and it'll stick out well. Whereas a stone which has to be seen from several directions, and it has to be high so that it can be seen from the directions it has to be seen. Alexander Tom also noticed that in Brittany. He said the tall stones are seen from different positions many miles away. And you see that with the alignments. And I'll show you one or two examples where a stone is placed on a ridge exactly where it has to be in exactly the right height to be part of this alignment system. And as I said, the excitement of this subject is when you find an alignment and you find there's a gap in the chain of intervisibility, you can very often, or I say very often, you can theoretically, I've actually done it in practice once or twice, found the stone which is missing, maybe, fallen, maybe it's fallen, maybe it's unrecognised. And an awful lot of stones are still unrecognised because they stand in hedges, as the Cornish call those stone walls. And... Uh, uh, they're, 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 I think very often when they made these stone walls in the first place, they used existing stones, which may, in any case, have probably marked a boundary, and they built up them and incorporated them into the into the stone walls, which which border the uh, which border the, uh, uh, the fields. So there's a lot. I've just discovered quite a number since, which are standing there in the hedges, and you could, uh, well, you can recognise them because they're earth fast. Now they're not piled up, they're, they're, they're standing in the ground. And also, very often, as I said, they're in an existing or a, 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 a already recognised alignment. And you can see what part they're playing in this alignment. They have to be seen from here, and they, from here from there, you must see the, the, the next place in line. So there's an awful lot of work to be done still, and I wish, I always wanted some, like, university department to take over this area do a complete survey of it all, and then check on the alignments. And then you can find, probably restore a lot of the system to, to what it was before. Discover lost stones, uh, uh, discover where stones must have stood and excavate for the stone hole and such. This is a, 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 a subject for the future. But because they still, you see, uh, the officials, and the, uh, uh, I know these things are changing quickly, but they still don't like this alignment system. Uh, and it, 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 it uh, I don't know what there is in it, but it, 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 it very much turns them off. And they don't, and people who've been educated in archaeology really don't like this subject. I suppose most people are conventionalists, you see, and if they're told they don't like this subject, there's nothing in it, then they don't like to go into it. You know how it is. Uh, it's the same as um, the days of the Soviet Union, Soviet science. You had to just do what, what was... <laughs> but we have the same thing here, but we call it something else. Anyway, let's look at some pictures. Here we are coming down to Cornwall along that extremely significant axis, the axis of, of southern England, from the furthest east to the furthest west. These lines, uh, these great axis lines across the country, were referred to in the old British chronicles Geoffrey of Monmouth describes how uh, I think it was one of the queens to whom it's attributed was the legendary Queen Helena, who laid out straight causeways from one end of the island of Great Britain to the other, and between all the capes and headlands. And one of them he mentions is the uh, Ic the Icneal Way, a very ancient pre-Roman straight stretch, uh, a straight stretch of track or line or whatever it is. Some parts, but certainly a, a, a trackway and a road going from the furthest end of East Anglia, in fact, from the Norfolk-Suffolk border. Now, county borders are very important, particularly at the sea. <coughs> There's nothing to mark that border, no natural feature. It's just there, because that's where it had to be, uh, to be the end the terminus of this line. And then it goes through the... If you draw the straight line to the furthest point west of the land's end, it'll go through various places... Uh, um, uh, 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 many of them, because they're on hills, dedicated to the Archangel Michael in succession, almost certainly, to 
the Mercury, Apollo, it's Mercury, really, the, the god who preceded it. And you see in France, actually, hills which are dedicated to Saint, the, the Archangel Michael and the Saint Mercury, uh, as a Christianized pagan uh, saint. Uh, and at the, I, I suddenly did a book much later called At the Center of the World, uh, which, est- which established what this axis is, how the ancients always found the axis of that territory, that is the longest line you can draw across it. And they made their ritual centre as far as possible at the centre of this line. The idea being, I think, that this was the, like the pole of the universe, a meaning which was, which was a symbol of divine law and truth. And they wanted their installation place where the chiefs were installed and where their rituals were done to be at the centre of that territory, on that axis, to symbolise lawful <coughs> rule and such. And of course the ancient way of regarding uh, the high king and such was somebody who married the real possessor of the earth, that is the goddess who is its, um, who is its deity. And he, he, the king, they choose the finest young man and ritually marry him to, uh, uh, to the goddess of the country. And if she liked him, he won his battles, he made it rain, that sort of thing, then uh, uh, all went well. If you didn't like him, things went badly, they got rid of him. They weren't sentimental about royalty in those days. They, 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 they had the man who, really, who, who, who could do it. Um, uh, so the, the, this is one of those axis lines mentioned by Geoffrey, by um, William of Marsbury as the Icknell Way, and indeed conforming to the eastern side to the actual line of the Icknell Way. It runs straight to Avebury, which is more or less the centre of the line, it's within about 20 miles of the centre. And of course Avebury is distinguished by many natural features to be the ancient ritual centre of southern England, which it no doubt is. And the whole land round there is rather like the lands round Delphi, sacred to the priests and to the pilgrims and, and uh, people who came there throughout the year for various festivals, that is cattle fairs and games and sports and uh, r- r- rituals and judgments. Uh, all took, must all have taken place there, and the land around it is probably farmed for the benefit of the uh, pilgrims and travellers who came there. <coughs> and after, uh, well, I'll just shh, let me see. There we are, looking for the northeast, northwest, at the great ring of Avebury, and the uh, uh, the line you will see. Uh, 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 that axis line going to the west of Cornwall goes, you can see it again uh, from the t- top right to the, to the bottom there, through the southern entrance to Avery, very near where that great stone is, the, you know, the Druid seat, whatever it's called, it has a seat in it. And then it goes parallel to, uh, to, the, to the roads, right down through next stop being, um, well, one of the next stops being Glastonbury Tor. And you see also that line going horizontally along, latitude 360, 360 over 7. That's a unique <coughs> line of parallel. It's a seventh part of the distance around the world if you were to start at the equator and go through the poles. Now, or in other words, it's four-sevenths of the distance between the equator and the North Pole. The three-seventh part is by, uh, near Delphi, and the two-seventh part is Thebes in ancient in, in ancient Greece. So these f- divisions were actually marked by uh, uh, special places. And you see how that line goes through the northern part of Avebury. And uh, Stonehenge, the, the, that line coming down, is actually the one that runs to Stonehenge. And the north-south line from Stonehenge is exactly a quarter of a degree south of that 360 over 7 degree line. But that's another thing, I, I covered that a lot with, with Robin Heath in a book called The Measure of Albion. And I've since made a lot of progress with that. a very exciting subject, because you do see that, 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 that there is a kind of magical, very uh, carefully surveyed and beautifully uh, designed um, Kind of a series of surveyors marks across the country, which are more than practical. It's like a magical thing, like it's like an enchantment in some, of some kind. It's something to do with... Because they're also harmonically arranged. There's also, you can take these intervals on these lines and see them as being uh, 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 um, uh, 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 um, like a musical harmony, the intervals of a musical harmony. So from Avebury, which is, I say, the ritual centre of southern England, and the lands around it the same, we go on to, well, just look out of the window and you'll see that glass be torn in, in, in the floods. And 
it's interesting to see where the line actually goes because it can be calculated absolutely precisely. So if you have the points on it, and, and uh, uh, Robert Forrest, uh, um, who's a good mathematician, he calculated some years ago and sent me these drawings. And there you see glass and be tall, rather exaggerated. Now here, we, uh, uh, and there you see the line, uh, the, the Icknell Way line, going through Og Ogborn St. George Church, just east of Avery, through the entrance to Avery, parallel to the road, or sometimes on the road, going further west, and then going over Glastonbury Tor, and you'll see it goes right through the, the, the summit of it, on the church, and it's aligned with the Pilgrim's Way, going up the Tor. And then, uh, a, a 10 or 11 miles further west, is that one of the most remarkable monuments in, in southern England, the most enigmatic mo monuments in southern England. That thing up there, uh, which is a little, little imitation of Glastonbury Tor called Burrow Bridge or Burrow Mump. Uh, and from there, on the top, you can see the Tor absolutely on that same line. And again, the axis goes along the axis of Burrow Mump and continues westwards. Uh, which is odd, and there's nothing, if you go to Burmump, you see there's nothing like it anywhere around this completely flat country. It floods in the winter, and it's an inland, like an inland sea. And just this huge hill arises. Now, is this artificial? How was it put there? How has it come to be, say, by chance, upon this existing and natural axis, furthest east and furthest west of England? And other questions about it. I'd like to find a geologist who could really do an investigation of it and see what it really is made of because it's a complete anomaly stuck there in the middle of this flat country, right exactly where it has to be to, uh, to give the, uh, um, the direction of this line. And indeed, from there, the centre of that hill to the centre of Glastonbury Tor will set the whole axis of, of the whole orientation of that line. Um, and then, going, f f going further west, we come to another extraordinary monument, the Cheese Ring on Bodmin Moor, isn't it? Yes. Uh, which is a top of a tor with an ancient enclosure around it, Stowe's Pound, the thing is called, and in it is this great pile of rocks, which, did, which old Borlase in the um, <coughs> 18th century said was a, 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 a druid construction. It's got cup and ring marks on it, but certainly used by the ancients. To what extent it's natural and artificial? Again, it's such a coincidence it should occur precisely upon this alignment. But there it is. Um, I think there are many great works around the country which are not recognised as being artificial because we can't conceive of them having been uh, 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 made by the so-called primitive people who we, uh, who we used to imagine were the only inhabitants of this country. But the further back you go, the big, the more, the greater, I think, and more anomalous are the uh, are the unrecognised works of the ancients. Um, then again, going further west, now, this is a natural tour with uh, it's not St. Michael's, it's St. Michael's Church, Bryn Tor in Devon. It's not right on the alignment, it's just, it just, it comes at this side of it, so it's not right on it, but it's a natural thing, and, and it was part of the alignment. Originally, I think, they were, these were shrines occupied by hermits, priests of Hermes, who kept a light going for the benefit of travellers and to signify that they were, their prayers, the hermits were combating the demons of the upper air. In other words, fulfilling the role of the archangel Michael. Oh, when we come down to, to the land's end and the line disappears out to sea, and it doesn't touch the Scilly Islands, but you see this part of this extreme west of Cornwall where it runs to and the Scilly Islands, they've got more monuments in them, more ancient monuments than the whole of the rest of Cornwall. For example, in the Scilly Islands, it's stiff with, I don't know if you've been there, anyone who's been there, it's absolutely stiff with barrows, great stone barrows, mounds, burial places, very ancient, about 5,000 BSC or something like that, indicating it really was the, like the land of the dead to which the souls of the dead were supposed to go. Uh, in the course of their cycle through life and, uh, and rebirth. Because, of course, the whole of ancient science was very much to do with the progress of the soul into death and into rebirth. And there's some kind of process by which they were able to uh, 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 harmonise this process and, uh, and use it for the benefit of the fertility of the land and the spirit of the people. Oh, we're well, just coming down to Lands This actually isn't Lands End. This is, I just put them in these nice pictures. They're um, in Brittany, uh, taken around the beginning of last century. Uh, the lads having a good time and having a, one's having a smoke, I think, at the bottom of the, uh, this beautiful stone. And another typical one, which has been, you see the people there 
they used to come there for various reasons of fertility and, and uh, magic and such. And this one's had a, been carved in early times so that a cross stands upon it. The top has been mutilated into a cross. And that's quite a common feature you find around Cornwall and in, in, in the moors of Cornwall and Devon. Devon. Big stones which have been reshaped and reused as, uh, or Christianized as crosses, but they still served as waymarks for travelers across the moors and they had to find old tracks and old sacred paths. Uh, now, here we are, really are in, in, in West Cornwall, and the, the, most, well, the, the most loveliest and best known of the stone circles there is one called Boscoe Nun, which means house in the wind, house, no, it's trying. I don't know what it means, something in the Cornish tongue, I can't remember what it means actually, or oh, something, it's the spring by a hollow or something like that. But I haven't actually got a picture of it, uh, but I have got a picture of it in the distance. Do you see that left hand picture? There's a little standing stone there, uh, propped up by a, a, a sort of platform beside it. And in the distance, where its, where its tip indicates, you can see the ring of stones of Bosco and 19 stones, and further on, further on, the old track which continues uh, um, eastwards, <coughs> and according to Lockyer, it marks from the centre of Boscoenun, uh, 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 that track between the high banks marks the May Day sunrise point. And uh, what, when I first went there, you could stand at that circle and you could see this near stone on the left standing up like a little finger on the horizon, very, very clear. Uh, and when you went up beyond it, another stone came into sight beyond it in the hedge. Both of those have since been taken away. It's most very sad. A farmer must have... Uh, uh, they were not recorded, you see, in anywhere. I had to, to, to find them. But so many of the ones I found were later on destroyed. But we have got evidence of it in, in this photograph. And, you, and then there it is, close up. Not a very good picture. And you see the big slab, which is sort of serving as a pavement for it, and the cattle around it. And, yeah... Yes, you can just see, there's an arrow marking it with number five, in the far distance, the tip of the stone which comes into view as you walk from the circle towards this stone. As you get up there, then you see the next stone popping up there. But as I say, both those stones and the wall it's in have now gone. Uh, um, and that is on that same alignment as, as Lockyer recognised as being a May Day. A, a, like the sunrise on, on, on May Day, which is, of course, when the Cornish holy wells come into operation and when the f healing and fertility and other qualities associated with these monuments are... Uh, there is... There's that track again, see, uh, from Boscone and going east. It goes over a little stone, I'll show it to you later, a tiny stone cross in the roadside, which I had to sort of practically dig out because it was all covered over and tossed. But it was only about that high. But that, uh, th that was one of the markers. Then this lovely thing of the Tresvanic Pillar, one of the nicest stones in West Cornwall. And you see how their shapes squared off, the bases are squared off, and they seem to have been polished, rather like those axe, those, uh, axe heads and ritual things that the Bronze Age people had. <coughs> and on the right here is... The alignment. Now, the stone circle is over on the left, and then there is one, two, three, four stones. In, this is an aerial photograph, of course, and, and, and uh, 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 you, uh, they, they, you can see the points of the stones on the photograph, and you see they stand in precise alignment. And then there's a fifth one out of the picture, which I found later, uh, towards the, that's towards the sea, and it has cup marks on it. I hope it's still there. Uh, um, well, it hadn't been there for quite a while. And that's one, that's one of the main alignments, I think, because all these stones are intervisible. Uh, uh, that one's now been taken away. It was only a small one. That one has... Uh, you can still see it in the photograph. It's, in the photograph, it's fallen, and it's subsequently been taken away. That one is still... Uh, uh, one of them is still there, and one of them has fallen down into there. So it's going very quickly. And also, it's not so easy to walk about the fields it used to do. In the old days, it was, uh, it was, uh, they all belonged to the local farmers. They were all farmed by the local farmers, who take a lenient view. If you ask them to go on their land, they wouldn't mind. Now things have become much more private, so it's a bit more difficult. Also, there's probably more visitors, too. So they... Um, 
that, I promised I showed that little stone which was on the, uh, uh, from Boscoenun on the midsummer sunrise, uh, the, sorry, the May sunrise line. You see how small it is. There's the road. It's just in the It's all overgrown with, but Locke said where it was, and I was able to pull back the gorse <coughs> and expose it. It's probably got covered up again. And that's another one. I just, have, I just um, it happened to be in my, in my slides. I didn't find any alignments for it, but it stands, it's typical of the unmarked and, un, and unrecorded stones, which still stand in the fields. That is right in the field. No one's recorded it. And then again, I think that's, Yes, you often get stones like that in the hedge, as I said. You recognise that stone when you see it. Uh, uh, um, but if you're not looking for these things, you just say, oh, it's another stone in the hedge. And then uh, uh, down here, another one, which is actually known, which is on the road leading up to Boscoenun Circle. Uh, oh, that one actually... Uh, uh, I don't know how it got into this lot, but, but, but it's, it's, in, it's a stone in Brittany. But it is rather relevant because the central stone in Boscoenun Circle leans forward at a similar angle. And there's been controversy about whether it's always leaning like that because Borlais in the, in the 18th century shows it leaning forward like that at quite an angle. So perhaps it's always been like that. Uh, um, and it points in the direction of that main alignment. And there's another one, just near Boscoenun, standing in the field, part of an alignment system. And you see its twin demolished and built into the wall, into the hedge, <coughs> alongside it. No one ever knows where that stood, because it's not recorded. It was done a long time ago. Probably stood in the hedge, and they knocked it over to make a, to make a base for the wall, or something like that. <coughs> uh, oh, sorry, these aren't very good, these things. There's, again, the transmetic pillar. But they, all they really show... And, and it isn't very enlightening, but the the fact of these very very straight alignments. These are not just a, just these are not just um, approximate alignments. They are absolute centre to centre, like a, 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 as Chris earlier said, like a rifle sight, something like that. Really, completely straight. And the statisticians can't quite deal with that because they take a tolerance. When they tighten up that tolerance, then the, st the instance of alignments gets higher because they're all, if they're right, they're absolutely spot on. There's no near enough business here. Oh, Christ. Oh, uh, again, it doesn't, I, I, on the side you can't see very much, but it just shows some of the alignments in that, in that district. And... Well, I'll just get on to the next one, actually. Uh, and there's that, I think that horse is by that little stone which has been destroyed. Yes, it is. So I remember it was a frisky piebald horse and I went up there to photograph it. Okay, fine. Uh, again, another stone nearby. It's earth fast. It may have been cut off, but that's an ancient stone. And there's an obvious one in the field. The farmers will say, oh, my grandfather, great-grandfather put that there to, as a rubbing post for cattle. But this rubbing post for cattle thing is a complete myth, I think. I think it's just, everyone said, oh, they must be put there as a convenience of cattle. You get it all over the country, in Scotland and such, oh, these are rubbing stones for cattle. And, of course, the cattle do like a rub, as you know, so they do rub against them, but, but that was not their original purpose, I imagine. Uh, and the next stone circle, I don't know what that is in the sky. Yeah, it must be a UFO. And who, I don't know who it is who's practising, is that Jamie George? But it's, no, it's a woman, isn't it? Anyway, that's a Merry Maidens, another circle with 19 stones, whatever the significance of that may be. Uh, uh, that's one of the most perfect ones, the most visited, because it's easily obtained, from, it's easily accessed, accessed from the road. And all around it, in the hedges and such, are a profusion of uh, megalithic monuments, whole stones, smaller stones, stones built into hedges. And you can st I found, John Barnett found one near there, and I found two or three in, near there, unrecorded. Uh, there's the most obvious one near the Merry Maidens. It's only a few, uh, it's only a field away from it. Uh, it's called Goon Reef, meaning the Stone of Blood, I think, something like that. Because many of these stones, the folklore is, oh, they commemorate a battle, or they commemorate people turned to stone. It's a lovely stone. Um, look at the lovely lichen on it. You get that in this country. There's one I found, and that's me on it. And I, can, I think Paul Deborah took that photograph. I was, and I, I, found he, 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 I didn't take photographs myself. <coughs> and he took it on, uh, uh, um, when, we, uh, when we went there. I don't know who that is in front. Um, another view of this one discovered it's right. It, it forms an alignment from the Merry Maidens through the two stones called the Pipers. 
the largest, the tallest standing stones in West Cornwall. The biggest one is 16 and a half feet. And they stand in line from the circle of, of Merry Maidens, just over the hedge and over the ridge. So you can't see them from the circle. But there must be a stone missing which took the line over the ridge. And then those two circles, then this one comes in, a newly discovered one, or rather discovered about 10 years ago, or something like that. Again, another view of it. You see, it's been used as, as a sort of buttress for where two hedges, where two walls meet. And to repeat myself, I think quite likely that they already marked boundaries. And then when they put the walls in, they used the existing boundary. And of course, you made use of the stones to bridge a yard or so of, uh, 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 um, of wall. Another one is such a common sight, the fallen men here, beauty, it must have been a big one. And one that's still standing, that's a bit further north of the many maidens. And the third circle, I need to cover, is this. There were originally three circles. Now that one and a half are visible, or one and a few stones, it's a Tregazil stone circle north in the northern part of this district. And don't forget, this district's only eight by eight miles. Uh, um, uh, and... Uh, that still has uh, uh, many uh, uh, alignments from it. But they're very, very subtly arranged. See, this stone circle is still there. This one, that line is a, is a stone hedge. And all those stones have gone apart from some which got built into the hedge. You can still see those. And this so-called semicircle has gone entirely. No one knows uh, where it was. But if you stand, go to that circle, and you stand on the very edge of it, or just outside the very edge of it, and you, you're looking to the east, to the range of hills, you see, you see that stone on the horizon. And we, um, that's uh, yes, uh, Ray, I remember that little girl. She, and then, uh, and, and that stone carries that line over the ridge. But you can only just see the very top of it from from exactly the right point in that circle. Uh, 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 to the west of it. And this on a high ridge, and it takes a line over. And it takes it over to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, other line monuments. And this one below is typical of the quoits of that district, called, um, I think it's uh, Mulford Quoit. And you can see the underneath that capstone where it had been <coughs> carved to receive the uprights. But unfortunately, the capstone has slipped off. It's a, it's a nice area, that Mulford area. There's a prehistoric village there and other things. But it's all in a very small area. Oh, that just shows, so again, it doesn't mean very much, I'm afraid, and it's upside down also, the, uh, two of those main alignments from the triggers, the old stone circle, going, uh, there's no question of chance, because since the stones were everywhere, uh, they're, 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 they're limited in number, very limited in number, and when they're aligned, they're aligned straight on, so there's no possibility of, despite what people what, what people like to believe it, but if you get down to see it for yourself and you take a scientific view of it, you can't deny the fact of alignments, actually. That's a beautiful one. It's on one of those alignments uh, quite near the Ding Dong Mine, one of the old um, tin mines, um, standing in a, a, a ruined hedge. Isn't that a beauty? And you see that shape is so typical of the megalithic, neolithic... Uh, art forms, those I said, those stone axes, they have beautifully carved. And, well, I think I was told that the time, so let's stop there. I think I've made all the points I want to make. And do go down there, uh, uh, anyone who can. And uh, believe me, there's plenty more to find there. Uh, um, and it's worthwhile doing. And you can become f f immortal fame for discovering a, a, a stone in the line that it stands on. Okay, thank you so much. I'll say goodbye now. Bye. <laughs> This has been a Megalithomania audio production. For more information, visit megalithomania.co.uk.